singing that he's going to play. And then he's going to give a talk. And uh, I should add that uh, Peter Hawkins, who's an expert on Urdu, <laughs> is going to give a very a spontaneous translation of some of these for us all. But it, uh, first of all, thanks to Holly for having this wonderful party. Where is she? She's oh, over yeah, here. Yeah, here. Well, uh, definitely the hostess with the mostess here and she it's but it's it's a delight to have Dawood back with us he's a very distinguished person in his own right indeed uh, academically professionally and known internationally but for us he's just a very good friend not just but he's a he's a very close friend and we miss him dearly at the university and it's it's a great treat to have him back. Alan, you were going to say a word, too, about him. All I can do is second what you've said, except that... That sounds good, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I remember when I met uh, Dowd for the first time, he was in the Department of Missions. In the School of Theology. Oh, Missions? Or in Missions. Oh, missions. <laughs> missions, right. Because back in those days, was, that's where you got comparative religion. You know, theology schools and the Departments of Missions. And Daoud then was the uh, sort of window to the world in the uh, School of Theology, and people sort of flocked to his uh, to his courses just like they did when he joined the religion department by the hundreds, and uh, where he used to crack up the students, as my daughter said, <laughs> with a sense of humor, and of course feed them too. Yeah, that's so right. I think that very few professors that feed their students, you know, literally, but Bob, but uh, Dowd was famous for doing that. In fact, I think one of the, I think, Herb, you remember the time that uh, Dowd fed Gershom Sholem and John Silber and uh, I, I do. Blotzer. We had this sit-down thing, yeah. hippie style, at 242, and 242 uh, base there, there, yeah. And it was quite uh, quite an experience. And I remember when John Silver came in, he said, you know, I've got a meeting in less than an hour. And it was about 12.30 or so, and I, I can't spend too much time. Three and a half hours later, we were all sitting there, exactly. quite inebriated with uh, Dowd's uh, spirit and, and wine, <laughs> to be frank. Um, so 232 Bay State Road was the best location we ever had. Yes, it, it was indeed, and Dowd made it very special. So, no further ado. Should I, should I just say something like yeah, that? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, there, is all, there are also other occasions. You're going to have one. Tomorrow, Dowd comes to my class at uh, 1230 right. or 235. And Andre de Quadros, who is the director of the music division of the College of uh, Arts and Sciences, is going to have also. Yes, we're, we're going to have. Uh, it's at four o'clock tomorrow, and uh, I, I just want to. By the way, I just want to say thank you very much to to Hub and to Mike and to Holly and uh, and Alan and everyone. It's it's a, it's a wonderful collaboration that we can we can have uh, Dao G. Uh, at our school, and it's interesting that that uh, that in all the years that he was at at BU, we the School of Music never hosted uh, an an activity for him. But but now, um, after so many years of his association at BU, we are honored um, that that he's going to be uh, going to be giving us a, a session tomorrow. I want to encourage all of you to come tomorrow because you will sit on the floor, and um, although. You, the, the, the rugs and carpets are not are not like in this splendid place, but but uh, but please come. And what Dawood and I spoke about was that was that it would be very much tomorrow a way for you could for you to understand North Indian uh, vocal musical traditions, uh, and and so it's so he's going to he's going to engage us all. Um, we won't be inebriated with anything other than his spirit, um, but uh, but I, I think we will certainly be infected by his knowledge. Uh, so I I hope that you can all come at four o'clock. And just to give you a sense, eight fifty-five Commonwealth Avenue, which is which is the ugliest building on campus, uh, across from Starbucks. Um, and if you come in, it's on the second floor. Where it's the List Lounge. Uh, 
if you ask anyone, this, this lounge, but we'll, we'll, have, we'll have signs, uh, but it's on the second floor. So we look forward to seeing you at, at 4 o'clock tomorrow. And I have to apologize because we have a concert tonight and I have to leave. <laughs> I was hoping we'd, we'd have some, some of Dawood before I had to leave, but, but I only had the wonderful food and drink before we had to leave. So please accept my apologies. <laughs> But but uh, but we look forward to seeing it at four o'clock tomorrow. Thanks. 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 Okay, Dawood. I'll stand for a short while, and then sit down. Okay. I'm, I thank first of all Dr. Davidson for hosting this uh, reunion of mine with my dearest friends and colleagues from Boston University. I was at BU for 21 years exactly and it surely was the stablest period of my career. <laughs> Before that I was first teaching in Lahore in Pakistan. Then I went to teach in Turkey, Canada. Uh, no, first of all in Cambridge, England. My first teaching experience was in Cambridge, England, where I taught Urdu and prepared the syllabus of Urdu for the tripos in Urdu. But then I returned to Pakistan where in the Department of Islamics I lectured for a few months. From there I proceeded to Canada to teach under Cantwell's professor Wilfred Cantwell Smith who was director and founder of the Islamic Institute in, at McGill University. Then the Pakistan government sent me to occupy the newly created chair in Pakistan history <coughs> under the direction of NATO for goodwill between Pakistan and Turkey. I held that chair for three years. Uh, it's a fantastic story of my experience of the totalitarian secularism of Turkey. Sometimes <laughs> I'll write about it. I wrote about it to Secretary Albright, she didn't acknowledge my letter. <laughs> <laughs> I said I would tell her about my experiences in Turkey. From Turkey, I came directly to the USA with the help of Professor Kyler, T. Kyler Young of Princeton University, who tried his best to hire me for Princeton, but some colleagues interfered and it didn't come about and it gives me great joy to find out that the hostess of this evening was the first winner of the Kyler, Professor Kyler Young Prize in Persian <laughs> Studies. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Young received me and my family at Port Authority, the docks in New York. The fir my first night in the USA I spent in his home. And Mrs. Young had a pet dog taller than a German Shepherd <laughs> that kept le leaping onto my lap. And I was scared and she couldn't understand why a civilized man like me wouldn't love a dog. <laughs> so I explained to her that my fear of dogs was bred in by my experience of the street dogs of Lahore in Pakistan. I was afraid of dogs. So that's the explanation I gave to her. <laughs> now down the memory lane, <clears throat> It was my great uh, good luck to be hired by Dean Mulder of the School of Theology at the recommendation of Professor Wilfred Smith, who was 
instructed by Professor Young to find me a job. <laughs> and Cantwell Smith would perhaps not have done it if Kyler Young had not ordered him to find me a job. <laughs> my good luck was, uh, is in terms of my being invited to teach at BU. Courses in the study of religions of South Asia and Far East, which was most unexpected. I had no, I, my knowledge of these was minimal at that time. And he said, will you be willing to teach these? My resu resume didn't show any evidence of my having had anything to do with this field. I had taught courses in Islamics, Arabic literature, a bit in Farsi literature, Urdu literature, and Islam in India. But I said yes, I accepted the offer. And the lectures I gave for the first two years were so stupid. <laughs> I, I didn't know how to go about the field. And one day the students, in the, I was hired by the School of Theology, and the student, I entered the classroom, and, and the students, were, there was a complete hush silence and a kind of rebellion. What's going on? And what I was doing was giving a, a summary of my doctoral thesis to impress them, which was the wrong approach to teaching that subject. <laughs> because that's the field I knew best. <laughs> and I said, what's the matter? Why are you so silent? <laughs> and this, they said, what you're teaching makes no sense. <laughs> I said, oh, I said, let me give you today a different kind of lecture. And then I gave an anecdotal lecture of my experience of Muslim, uh, uh, Hindu, Muslim, of all sorts of personalities, which was anecdotal and it was entertaining. And when I ended, they clapped and said, that's the way to teach. <laughs> and from then on, I studied and I learned and learned more and more as year after year. And the study of polytheistic religions fascinated me. And one of my soulmates in Pakistan who is a psychologist of great caliber and worked for the UN for 12 years, uh, made one statement to me one day as we were discussing religion. He said, polytheism and monotheism, he said, he's a psychologist, are two universal modalities of the human psyche. That may stun some of the monotheists. But I agree with them, that either you are born a monotheist by heredity and then your unconscious is playing games, polytheistic games, or you are born in a polytheistic culture and then monotheism is playing a game. But what one of the first things that fascinated me as I lectured, can I have a glass of water, please? Was the study of Chinese religion. And I was fascinated by the difference between the Christian idea of the Father in heaven and the Chinese idea of Father Heaven. The Chinese talk, have talked about Father Heaven without any serious interest in anthropomorphizing the idea. It is Father, of course, then, just as people talk about Mother Nature without treating her like a mama. We all talk about Mother Nature, 
and bulldozer. <laughs> but in, chi in China, they talk about Father Heaven, which is a, an idea that comes close to pantheism, really. So I will not, uh, now request, I, as a result of that, I wrote a book-sized poem in Urdu of about 100 pages. One poem, a, ser a whole <coughs> series of poems, one of them was entitled Papa Heaven. I will now request uh, Professor Peter Hawking to read a section of that poem. I hope I can do this justice. Papa Heaven. A hermit rushed one day out of his dingy cell, declaring with a grateful sigh, but for the open heaven we die from claustrophobia. Our sight is in the closest touch of his boundlessness. He has never denied us his veritable visibility. He exchanges glances with us. In his infinite kindness, there's shelter for us all. What seems to be his distance is only an invitation. The flow of time has convinced the peasant that what's above is not an anchorless void, but mysterious grace. The real, real heaven is beyond the host of stars, beyond all narrowness, beyond crowd and congestion. By the power of signals from yonder, destiny wakes up or slumbers. Of all the colors, there are two that give the best comfort. First, there is the blue, the pure heavenly hue. It is the world, it is the color of the world's soul, not the color of its body. Then comes the green of the meadow, the color of velvety grass, the color of springtime and foliage. Above shines the sun, gilding the green with its rays. Sunshine and shade together carry out an assignment meant to quicken the seed. All this interplay reveals the disposition of dear Papa Heaven, by which he means to manage the distribution of rations. The arteries of nature are filled with the juice of affinity, Within this scheme of sustenance, the bee gives us the honey. Study the text of nature. Nature itself is the scripture. The knowledge of this lovely secret will make your inside smile. Hush. Lend your ears. Give this silence a chance. In a moment, it will turn into a confidential whisper. Every wave of breeze offers fresh revelation. To be sure, it will startle you if you care to listen to it. The ripples of tranquil water reflect an unfolding smile that lives only for a moment to deliver nature's greeting. That moment is the pearl of life. It is the ray that illuminates. When my brethren heard these things, out of sheer amazement they exclaimed, God save us from such! What queer, senseless religion! No prophet? No message from God? Do you mean to say, O Bard, that in China land they don't know the name of Allah? I sighed and then replied, Yes, brethren, that is true. This lively little dialogue left Papa to heaven diverted. <laughs> now, Robert, um, <clears throat> before I turn on the cassette player to reproduce the, the sound of my singing at a concert in the Sher George Sherman Union of BU on the 28th of March 1985. <laughs> I 
recollect another most interesting experience of, immediately after my retirement. In Florida, in, in the neighborhood where I live, there is a church. I won't tell you what denomination, a Protestant denomination. Two ministers from that church, one the elder and one his subordinate, knocked at my door. They were around the neighborhood trying to make more members of their church. So I opened the door and uh, they greeted me and I they said they were from uh, that particular church. I said, come in and, and made, I made tea for them. The senior minister sipped his tea and began a sermon. Without finding out what I was about, uh, what I was all about, where I was from, what's the story, he started his sermon. He went on for 20, 25 minutes, and he stopped when he got tired. <laughs> and then he said to me, "Who saves you?" I said, "As for our, my." salvation and afterlife, I'm counting on the help of an intercessor. But as for right here, it is the secular government of the United States. <laughs> so down the memory lane now, uh, I had, I performed practically uh, every year, well, sometimes along with my students who sang with me the songs I had taught them of Indian classical music. On 28th March 1985, I gave one of my annual concerts in the auditorium of Boston University George Sherman Union. In it, I sang a song composed by Sada Rang. Now, you haven't heard his name, you know, all the music composers of the West, you know. But Sadarang is a great name in Indian classical music. Court singer at the court of the Mughal Emperor Muhammad Shah, who is the Nero of Islam. Mm -hmm. Seventeen, He ruled 1719 to 48. The song is addressed to the emperor asking him to lead the celebration of the anniversary of Khaja Nizamuddin, Oliya who lived from, who died in 1324, a most celebrated Sufi saint of India, whose shrine in Delhi is visited by a constant stream of pilgrims every year. His anniversary is celebrated at his shrine with a program of classical music of India, performed by Muslim as well as Hindu maestros who pay homage to the saint in songs to the accompaniment of instruments. Instrumental music has been strictly forbidden inside mosques for 14 centuries. That's unbelievable. But has been enjoyed freely in the shrines of Sufi saints. Here is the recording of my performance of the song composed by Sadarang, dated 28th March 1985 in George Sherman Union.
Gaddafi, this is uh, how many years ago? It's 1885. That's uh, Me too. more than 20 years, 22 years. So I cannot do that kind of vocal acrobatics now. <laughs> I'll try to sing at the end of this uh, presentation, just a little something. I, ju I just think that Dad had one of the greatest Indian classical music voices, and I've heard some of the best, and, you know, um, Is singers... Is the right compliment coming from it? No, I wouldn't, say that. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say that. I don't make compliments easily, but... That is really what I mean. In his younger years, I thought he had one of the greatest voices, and you know, really loves music so much. You know. Now here I am tonight <laughs> to present to you the softer side of Islam. Islam has a softer side, and every great civilization has to have a softer side, at least for its own members sometimes for outsiders too. And uh, I hope some of you remember a commercial on the television that advertised what Sears Roebuck did. You know, the Sears Roebuck used to be a hardware business and then they switched and included clothing and perfumes and cosmetics and there was a, a pretty girl who sang that commercial for quite a length of time. I heard it. So, does anyone remember that here? So, it would have been best for some female voice to reproduce it. But I will at least give you an imitation. Come and see the softer side of Sears. <laughs> so I am here to talk about the softer side of Islam tonight. And I, will, I promise that I will relate to the, the crisis of today, this whole issue. Al Mas'udi, a great historian in Arabic, of Islam. In his uh, Muruju Zahab, the title of it is Muruju Zahab, Muruju Zahab, the Golden Meadows, that is, tells us right in the beginning of his history, of course he begins with Adam. And Adam is in the Muslim, popular Muslim belief, the first prophet, first of the prophets. He had direct contact with Allah. And when Cain killed Abel, Masudi tells us that Adam wrote an, uh, what is it in English, a dirge mm -hmm. uh, of Abel. Of course in Arabic. <laughs> And Masudi says that uh, the result was that Allah then divested Adam of his identity as a prophet, as punishment for producing that piece of poetry. He thought this uh, disobedient one had first tasted the forbidden fruit and now he is producing poetry. <laughs> and he, this means that he will continue to be a rebel. He, he, he will follow his own imagination and in, in Sufism imagination is, Satan is, is, is an embodiment of imagination. So he was divested and not, he, Masudi does not stop there. He tells us that uh, that uh, special privilege of prophetic identity was transferred to the Quraysh in Arabia. In, Eternity, in, in the imagine, imaginary of eternity, it happened that Quraysh were then uh, the, the tribe from which Muhammad came. So the prophethood was then potentially uh, the privilege of Quraysh. 
So the position of poetry in Islam is very different from the position of poetry in Christendom. The Quran has verses which uh, declare that a prophet cannot be a poet and a poet cannot be a prophet. It, it will take me time to, to produce the quotations like anybody needs. I can give you the references. Uh, verses of the scriptures are not on my fingertips like the ministers of churches, you know. <laughs> I think it, it will interest you. Now, also it should be mentioned that the Prophet was asked, who is the greatest Arabic poet? And he named Imr al-Qayas, who died uh, perhaps less than half a century before the birth of the Prophet. He, he was from a royal family. And uh, a, a lover by nature, a uh, lover of women by nature. The Prophet said, Imran Qais is the greatest poet, and on the, on the day of resurrection he will be the leader of the poets in their march towards hell. <laughs> <laughs> now uh, that I'm a, li a little, uh, I'll be hopping between topics. I now turn to Arabic poetry. And since uh, it was announced that, that music was expected of me, I included some, some musical aspects to my discussion of Arabic and Persian poetry here. The, the origins of Arabic poetry are in the Camel Man's Song. And the prosody of Arabic is affected by that. Why? Because, of course, the, the, this great friendship between the Camel Man and the Camel, <laughs> they have to have regard for each other's tastes. And the Arabic prosody is a bit loose by comparison with Persian prosody. Persian prosody is militant and, and regular. And the least of uh, minimum of liberty with the rhythm of the meter. In Arabic, such liberty is called zihaf, which literally means the she-camel, the dragging of her feet on sand. You can imagine the camel man is, of course, he's not behaving like the madrasa boys of Afghanistan. It's this way, you know. The swaying of the camel man is from left, right, left, right. That's the difference between the madrasa boys. <laughs> So zihaf is then it becomes a term of prosody, which in prosody then it means laxity, looseness in syllables count, in the count of syllables and dropping of syllables that is, the dropping of syllables. I'll give you one example. Bil okra darun min Sawalif ahubbin fi sfuadik munsibi. I won't translate, it'll take time. I'm here illustrating only the meter. Bil okre darun min jamila tahayyajat sawalif ahubbin fi sfuadik munsibi. You can see that the first line begins with bil okr. And bil is a long syllable. In the second line you have sawalif ahubbin. The first syllable in the second line is a short syllable. Sa. Sa walifa. So some of this dropping of syllables happens in the beginning of the line or in the middle, but this corresponds to the what happens to the feet of the camel on sand. So this is 
the, very, the fact that zihaf is, is a term of prosody derived from the camel's life, it proves that it, there's a relation between the, the meter and the camel, uh, the camel's movement. There are other examples, but I will not recite them. Now I turn to Persian prosody. And in that, first of all, I want to talk about the meter of the Persian quarter, which uh, is an evidence of the difference between the Irani, the Persian relation to Allah, and the Arabs' relation to Allah. The Persian's relation to Allah is in a state of uh, not exactly bewilderment, but something bordering between bewilderment and wonderment. When the, an Arab talks to Allah, he looks like this straight towards heaven like this. And when the Irani talks to Allah and looks at heaven, it is askance <laughs> <laughs> and this is a, a, an extremely important difference between the Arab relation to Allah. It, uh, it, I could also say that uh, in Arab's relation to Allah there is no foreplay. <laughs> And Iranis are, you know, playful. They're, what they did to the Nasr of the Arabic script, which is angular, and ended up being curves, elasticity, flexibility, and wonderment. So I will now recite uh, one quatrain. I'll recite a couple of quatrains of Khayyam attributed to Umar Khayyam because it, it's now established through very meticulous research that of uh, the, the entire uh, the anthologies attributed to Khayyam are not his really. Uh, the Khayyamian quatrains represent the Iranian mentality. It, it, they're not all by Khayyam, they, are, they have been attributed to him. We people wrote for emperors and then made beautiful manuscripts and presented anthologies of Khayyam, but they were not by him. One. Now see the very meter of Rubai is exclamatory. Un khasr ke bochar hamizad pahlu is as different from Bil Ukhridar Min Yameen. On Khasr Ki Bachar Hami Zad Pahlu Bar Dar Gahew Shahan Nihadan Deeru Deedim Ki Bar Kungar Ashfaq Tayye Abaz Hami Daad Ki Kuku Kuku it's pure exclamation. Zahid guyad bahisht bahur khushast. Man me guyam sharabe angur khushast. In naqd bigir o dast azan nasiya bedar. Awaz dohal shani dan az dur khushast. I could have recited one which is Bill Clinton's favorite, but it will take more time. <laughs> So now I will request uh, uh, Professor Hawking to recite the translation of one of these and I, my hat off to Fitzgerald for choosing the right meter in English. That was his mastery. 
and, 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 and great achievement. Arbury translated all the quatrains of, of Rumi. The meter is all wrong and, and, and the, the exclamation is not there. So. Okay. The ball no question makes of eyes and nose, but right or left, as strikes the player, goes. And he that tossed you down the field, he knows about it, all. He knows. He knows. He knows. He knows. That, that's the exclamation. Now there are easily nearly 50 meters of Persian poetry, which I cannot give examples of all of them, but a, a few. And see the difference between the Arabic uh, camel man's uh, zehaf kind of uh, meters and the Farsi. Uh, here is uh, the opening stanza from the panegyric written by Ka'ani, the court poet uh, at the court of Nasiruddin Shah Qajar, who ruled from 1848 and 1896, and Professor Brown really attended some events where Nasiruddin was there. Now see the difference. This is not camel man. Kind of. <laughs> Mafa'ilun, 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 mafa'ilun. This is the scanning of that. Banafshar usta az zameen badar fiju yabar ho. Wa ya gusasta hurayin za zulfa khishtar ho. Za sang agar nadi dai chisan jihad sharar ho. Ba barg ho ye lala bin meyan e lala zar ho. Ke chun sharar me jihad za sang ku husar ho. You see the difference? The... You know the hoofs of the cavalry? Mm -hmm. This is militancy, mm -hmm. the Iranian militancy. Now I'll give three, four examples of other Persian meters. Uh, the opening verse of Ghazal of Ghalib, the, the, the poet most admired in India, the Persian Farsi poet. Dush kazgar deshe bhaktam gila barru yeto bhut. Chashma suya falako, ruya sohan suya tubud. Another. Dil sara par dai mahabbat ust. Another. Yaram chokadha badast girat. I wish I had a drum to give you the beat. Aisham mudama staz la'le dil kha. Doni ke chis dolati di dare yar di dan, etc. Now there is a, there is a meter that uh, Hafiz has used and has not been used by Persian poets after him. But Ghalib, the poet of India, used it. And I'll recite just one line from Ghalib in Urdu. Aak meri jaan ko karar nahi hai. Aake meri jaan ko karar nahi hai, taqat bedad intizar nahi hai. So I was at Ghalib's centenary by invitation in 1969. I went to New Delhi to attend one week of the celebrations of Ghalib centenary. And there the All India Radio, which was a government network, asked the delegates to give little speeches for broadcast related to Ghalib. This is in 1969, soon after I joined BU. And Dean Mulder gave me the uh, leave to attend this event. And when they asked me to give a speech, it took me one day to plan it. And I included in it something which was musical. Aake meri jaan ko parar nahi hai. I felt that this, the beat of this meter, was suitable for Indian music and that a rhythm could be 
invented, congruent with this. Aake meri jaan ko karar nahi hai. Slowly. Aake meri jaan ko karar nahi hai. Din tik din din na katta tin tik din din. आग मेरी जान को करार नहीं है दिन तिक दिन 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 तिक दिन दिन सो आई हैड इन्वेंटेड दैट रिदम बिफोर गोइंग टू दिस इवेंट एंड द बैकग्राउंड ऑफ दिस इज दैट दिस पर्टिकुलर गजल हैड बीन संग बाय गौहर जान अ ग्रेट सिंगर फ्रॉम द ब्राथल्स ऑफ कैलकाटा हु वॉज the daughter of an english man and a dancing girl of calcutta she had english blood mixed blood she was fabulously beautiful so my father as a little boy in his hometown of firozpur heard that gohar jan would be performing he tried to buy a ticket and he could not then he climbed a wall and she was performing inside a compound and he listened to her singing this very ghazal as a child and he used to hum it after dinner sometimes i remember that and i remember the tune also <coughs> so i said to in my little presentation for broadcast from all india radio delhi station i told them that i included this thing in that program and a friend of mine the the next day brought me a, a recording of my presentation which includes this song so galib is by far the most admired poet of bilingual poet of india Uh, he wrote in Urdu and and Persian. So this is the recording of the this is the piece that was broadcast. one meter of urdu poetry 
which is derived from the native Hindi poetry. And this is a 16-beat uh, kind of thing. I'll recite uh, just one verse of that. The, the name of this meter is Pangal, which is not derived from Persian. All Urdu uh, poetry is in meters of Farsi poetry. All of them, except this one. And it's called Pangal. And a lot of classical Hindu stuff, poetry, is in Pangal. Either eight syllables, eight beats, or sixteen. Kal subh ke matlaye taabhaan se, kal subh ke matlaye taabhaan se, jub aalam bukkay noor huwa, sab chand sitare maand huwe, khurshid ka noor zuhur huwa. Ulti ho gai sab tadbire, kuch na dawa ne kaam kiya, dekha is bhi maariye dil ne aakhar kaam tamam kiya. This corresponds to the most popular rhythm of Indian classical music called Tintal, which is 16 beat, which is dha din din da, dha din din da, dha tin tin ta ta, din din da, dha din din da, din ta, din din da, dha din da, dha din din da, dha tin ta, din din da, dha. This is the same. But this is a universal kind of primitive thing which you find even in the folk poetry of Europe. I, uh, long ago in classroom uh, in primary school, my te teacher uh, made us memorize a long poem, but I remember only the beginning of it. There was a naughty boy, and a naughty boy was he. He ran away to Scotland, the people for to see. <laughs> It's the same meter. It's something primitive and universal. <laughs> now I turn to the theme of a ghazal. And Western Orientalists have translated a lot of ghazal. Nicholson has done it, Arbery has done it, Gertrude Lothian Bell has done it. A lot of ghazal has been translated into English. And its importance has been emphasized, but it's not realized by Orientalists the scale on which there are consumers of ghazal. Ghazal has been sung and its consumers have been the entire populations of cities. It, 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 it was enjoyed for certain reasons that I will try to explain. The origins of ghazal is in Arabic poetry and the original ghazal, which literally means talking to gazelles, talking to women, that is. In Arabic poetry it was called tashbib, which means, if I make a, an awkward kind of translation of tashbib, means youthing, celebrating youth. And it, it is expression of uh, um, amorous feelings for a woman. That is what origin, the origins of ghazal is in tashbib. It, it, tashbib is translated by Orientalists as the erotic prelude, which was the opening of serious poems. And serious poems in Arabic were called qasida, the poems with a purpose. Qast, qast means purpose. Qasida was a poem with a purpose, which was uh, you know, the, the exploits of the tribe and boastful poems about the tribe's achievements and nobility. So, the, it's a poem with a purpose. And the first person to come up in Arabic with a, an erotic prelude of a serious poem was Imr al Qais, whom I mentioned earlier. The, whom the Prophet condemned. And uh, the first line of his Qasida, in which he has done his, this Tashweeb thing, is Qifa nabki min zikra habibim wa manzili. O my two companions, fellow travelers, stop here. Let us cry over the remains of the encampment of my sweetheart's tribe. 
this is the tashweep he began. It became customary in Arabic poetry and later in Farsi poetry too for some time to start a serious poem, a panegyric even in praise of a king with a tashweep. And the ghazal is actually the tashweep separated from the serious poem. That is what a ghazal is. So the, the Imral Kaas is telling us the affliction of unrequited love is much greater than being murdered on a battlefield. That comes first. Let's talk about uh, the, 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 the basic. And Sigmund Freud said, <laughs> that that comes first. So in the last nine centuries, in Persian, Turkish and Urdu, the crops of Ghazal have grown in such abundance, it's, un, it's, it's unimaginable. And it, it has influenced the milieu in such a way that the relation to Allah for, uh, mul for the multitude, the relation to Allah that started with the Qur'an got intervened by Ghazal. So that Ghazal intervenes to, to mitigate the intensity of the Qur'an's eschatology and to mitigate the Qur'an, uh, the monotheism's intensity, which is the biggest liability of monotheism. <laughs> intensity. It's not calm. Now, the, the, the interesting difference is that in Arabic tashbib, the sweetheart was mentioned by name. Invariably, she was mentioned by name, like in this verse that I recited. Bil darun min jameel atas hayyajat. Jamila is the girl. She's mentioned by name. But what happened in, in, after in Farsi was, that the women went behind the veil, courtship became impossible, and the sweet, the mention of the sweetheart in the ghazal, therefore, was managed with pronouns. And since in Persian the pronoun is neuter gender pronoun, you know, it was. You had to figure out, is it a woman, is it a man? And that tickled the listener. Who is this? Man or woman or Allah? Three. There are three alternatives there. I have myself, I take great pride in coining a word for Ghazal, a phrase for Ghazal. It is the poetry of pronoun. For God's sake, nobody has said that before. <laughs> It is the poetry of pronoun. It is most interesting. And it is produced for nine centuries. What's going on here? It must have been some very basic need that allowed this to go on and on. So in the one problem of translating ghazals into English is how do you deal with this neuter gender pronoun? And almost all the translators have used she, finding it awkward to say he, that sweetheart is a he, and you know, it, it, that no one was ready to start professing gay relations, you know, that it, it, no. So this translation, she is a problem. And I struggled with it myself in some of my translation work. How do you deal with this due to gender? U, U in Persian. Is it he or she? I suggest that it be translated every time as that one. <laughs> but it doesn't fit into the rhythm. The verse translation easily every time it's either that one. Sometimes I, I have used that saucy one. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> 
But uh, this, this reference, uh, the ambiguity, if you translate it as she, you are obviating the intended um, ambiguity here, if you translate it as she. For instance, uh, there is a verse by a great Farsi poet of India that Iranis have re given recognition to Amir Khusro. Khabaram Rasid im shabt nigar khahi amad Sareman fidai rahi ke sawar khahi amad I'm sort of breathless and must drink a little water <laughs> before I chant it a little. In the Raga Soni of India, this is mixing two cultures. I hope I'm not overdoing it here. Khabaram Rasid im shabt Nigar Hahi Ahmad Sare Manfida Yarahi Kisavar Hahi Ahmad Abadam Rasid Imshab Kanigar Hahi Ahmad Sare Manfida Yarahi Kisavar Hahi Ahmad Translation by Dr. Hadi Hassan of India who had in Irani mother. I have just had the news that my sweetheart will visit me tonight. Be my head a sacrifice to that road which will bring her riding to me. This her is a problem here. <laughs> it's not accurate. Now the, 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 the ghazal is, is a f most influential and fantastic thing that two immediate consequences of the conquest of Iran by Arabs, by the Arabs. There were three, but the, the going uh, of, of middle class women behind the veil, segregated in the conf inner apartments, confined to the inner apartments. But two other consequences are extremely important. Two things went underground. The women went behind the veil, but two other things went underground. The national religion of Iran, which was the state religion of the Sasanian Empire, Zoroastrianism, went underground. The priesthood of Zoroastrianism went underground joining forces with anti-Arabism. And the other thing that went underground was drinking. And the Zoroastrian sentiment and drink, the, the enjoyment of drinking combined forces. And uh, the taverns went underground and the Zoroastrian sentiment went underground. So the most interesting phrase in Farsi poetry is Pira Mohan, the, men, the Magian mentor, the mentor of the Magians, the Magian priest, or the priest of the fire temple, Pira Mohan. And it ended up being the phrase used for the bartender. <laughs> this is the combination of drinking which was strictly for, forbidden by Islam and in Pakistan all the nightlife on drinking that's going on is underground at this time, right now. So tavern and Zoroastrianism went underground and drinking became a ritual of freedom, symbol of the naughtiness dream. Drinking became a symbol of the naughtiness dream. Non-drinkers even said, we are drunk, we are staggering, you know, and pretending that they are enjoying what is missing in their life now. The origins of the jargon of antinomian libertinism in Persian ghazal and quatrains are in the taverns of Iran. And I am not kind of fabricating something. This is a fact. Nearly all the masters of ghazal 
were teetotalers. Can you imagine for nine centuries, teetotalers are producing tavern poetry <laughs> and pretending that they are frequenters of night after night they are in the tavern. Isn't that just funny? And, and, but, but, but it's important too. It's, it's funny and important. That what, what's going on here. In Ghazal they fantasized their enjoyment of tavern life and their courtship of imaginary sweethearts. This is what the spirit of Ghazal is. In Ghazal they fantasized their enjoyment of tavern life and their courtship of imaginary sweethearts, by means of ghazal they daydreamed what was missing in their lives. I'm making a, a, I hope I'm talking like a historian here and not just to entertain you. Let me divert you by playing for you a recording of a ghazal composed and recited by Hafiz Jalandri. Sorry. Yes. First, I, I will play a recording of singing of a, a ghazal by one of the greatest ghazal singers of India. Uh, it, was part, it is part of a memorial long play record produced by the sponsors of the Ghalib Centenary. And Muhammad Rafi is the great singer of ghazal. That's the next piece here. This is not my singing. This is a great... This was specially recorded to memorialize. cited by Hafiz Jalandri, author of the National Anthem of Pakistan. It's his voice. Uh, I got this recording recently for this function from a friend uh, for tonight. And uh, I knew Hafiz, he was a teetotaler, he lived next door to where we lived, he was a neighbor. I used to steal plums from his backyard and he used to catch me stealing the plums. And he had three daughters with two of them. Two of them were my playmates when I was six or seven. And uh, she, I used to climb mulberry trees in the mulberry season with these two si sisters, uh, you know, enjoy 
eating and collecting mulberries. <laughs> and so I know that for certain that he was a teetotaler. But this is a tavern poem, a ghazal by him. Only two, verse, two or three verses out of it. This is the voice of the, the author of the national anthem of Pakistan, Hafiz Jalandari. In a poetic symposium. And the po poetry symposiums were an epidemic uh, in the last day, two centuries of the Mughal uh, period of India. And uh, there was an etiquette protocol of these events, the Mushara, it's called Mushara, in which people acclaimed a lot, loud acclamation, anything that, so you will hear the audience acclaiming. Uh, the applause is a very interesting feature of this. Yes. So um, I hope this was relevant to his teetotaler. He became known in the country for his four-volume ver versified uh, narrative of the Prophet's life under the title Shahnama Islam. He was known as a man of, uh, you know, a Muslim spokesman and, uh, and uh, really a representative of the Muslim sentiment. And here he is, is a tavern poem, and I, I request uh, Professor Hawking to read the, the translation of two of the verses, of the verses that you just now heard. I like this one. <clears throat> Moonlit night, I vow, I vow to drink no more. Believe me, pals, I mean it. Ah, uh, but the sight of what's in that goblet is too much. Help me, Allah. Help me. <laughs> <laughs> and then, bro! And, yeah. yeah, where's my backup? Now, uh, you can see that, you know, <laughs> behind the religious for, uh, frenzy of, uh, Islamic frenzy of Pakistan, this is going on too. <laughs> you know. The culture is a multi-dimensional thing everywhere, but here it's a strange kind of paradox here. Now I'll just quickly finish. I wrote this part so as to not take too time by extemporizing my speech. The sweetheart in the ghazal is a nameless capricious cocket. Alluded to by means of an ambiguous pronoun of neutered gender, 
referable in lots of verses interchangeably to a flesh and blood someone and to Allah. This is the popularity of the Ghazal and its role in tuning the Muslimness of Muslims. The posture of the sweetheart in this imaginary relationship is that of Naz, which in Persian means coquettish egoism. This posture tells the lover, I can do without you. The attitude of the lover in imaginary courtship is that of Niyaz, which means in Persian dependence, reliance on the imaginary beloved to the effect, I can't do without you. In this daydream courtship of no one in particular, the lover takes loverly liberties and banters with the nameless beloved. The audience, you can't banter with Christ nailed to the cross. <laughs> the audience of the poet is free to believe, this is very important, that the poet is in fact bantering with Allah. This is to deal with the harsh eschatology of the Qur'an. So that when Allah says, hellfire, blazes of hellfire is waiting for you, unlike the theologian he, who will go on arguing and arguing about what exactly monotheism means, the poet of the Ghazal says, when he hears the threat of hell, he says, Sweetheart, don't be mad. <laughs> he makes a shortcut. He does not need all the, the, the theologians' uh, the, the celebration. The severity of the Qur'an's eschatology is mitigated by this fearless familiarity assumed by the poet as Allah's boon companion. Sinners are threatened in the Qur'an with horrors of hell on behalf of all the sinners. The poet protests in Ghazal telling Allah, Sweetheart, sweetheart let us be friends. <laughs> Every Ghazal producing poet has to have a poetical pen name. The adoption of a poetical pen name is an event of much importance. Once image changes with it, friends now take you less seriously and can te tease you taking innocent liberties with you, you are now a man of amour, you have declared your choice of the language of the unreason of drunkenness, the language of wit, exclamation and jest, the language of others. Your creed now is one of daydream, bewilderment, undogma and fortitude. In the last verse of every ghazal, the poet must insert his pen name. Sometimes it will be in the vocative case. Often it will be an allusion of some kind to himself. Here are a few examples out of thousands of pen names on record. Maftoon, which means distracted. Inkar, which means refusal. So that a poet calls himself Inkar and at the restaurant he shows up and you say, Hello Inkar, how is life? That's how you address. You forget their real name. Bichare, helpless. Avare, vagabond. Hasrat, regret. I mean, these are pen names. Vahshat, bewilderment. Sheshdar, which means agape. Taslim, which means obeisance or resignation. A good ghazal comprises no more than about ten verses. It is produced in a state of freest reverie. All the verses in it have a common rhyme. The clicking of rhyming words in the poet's head leads to ideas where only those get versified that the poet takes fancy to. In some verses the poet talks to some imaginary person. Other verses are soliloquy. Some are exclamations of puzzlement or delight or shock. Sentiments expressed in a ghazal are often hilariously inconsistent with each other. All thoughts in ghazal, lofty or banal, are versified with real or feigned amorous preoccupation. Thank you.
hope we are not going to discuss politics now. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you tremendously, Dawa. That was charming and lovely. And, and uh, I think it was Charlie Chaplin said that in order to be serious, you have to be funny. And uh, you are deeply serious and hilariously funny. <laughs> <laughs>